And thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Susan Storm, and I'm here with Jack Oliver Aaron from the World Socionic Society. Um, I am so excited today because we are going to be discussing the differences and sort of comparing and contrasting the differences between the Myers-Briggs system of typology and the Socionic system of typology. There's a whole lot of controversy about how these types align, and we're hoping to kind of parse through that together. And so, Jack, thank you so much for being willing to do this discussion with me. Well, thank you also for coming on onto um, my channel. It's going to be sort of a, a two-way thing at the moment, where it's going onto my YouTube channel, to your Facebook page. So I think we think uh, you can thank me, but also I can certainly thank you for coming on and to talk, getting to the grips with the differences between the two Jungian typologies. Absolutely, it's it's going to be a lot of fun. But well, first I wanted to ask you, um, and maybe we can do both do this, but how did you get into Socionics? Did you start out in MBTI and then veer into Socionics or did you start with Socionics? I started out in MBTI. I was 15 years old when I first took a pencil and paper test at school for PHSE okay. lessons. Okay. And at that time I got ENTP. Um, and I've pretty much tested as that consistently since. Although, um, saying that, I haven't really taken many of the official tests because, of course, it's more expensive to take the official test. Right. Um, in that, there's a guy called John Haxton who mm -hmm. works with the Myers Briggs company, and he thinks I might be an INTP. So you never know. Maybe I've changed. <laughs> we'll have to see. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm probably an INTP. And I got into socionics when I was on this personality oriented forum called Personality Nation. Okay. And on there I met this guy called Yuri Carrion from Puerto Rico. And he knew about this theory called socionics. And I thought it's like Mark Briggs, only it developed in Eastern Europe. How strange. So I sort of got mm -hmm. to know that theory a bit more, started using it to sort of debate. I used to like getting into typology debates when I was younger, and I haven't really changed since then. And <laughs> that's how I learned the theory. And around five years ago, I started doing um, personality typing professionally. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I started the World Socionic Society as well, which has been... Um, a good, um, a good group for people who want to find out more about the theory, want to learn some of the basics and then move up towards actually being able to type people themselves. And that's grown rather nicely by socionic standards. It's teeny tiny by Myers-Briggs standards, but by socionic standards, it's something I feel to be chuffed about. So, yeah. yeah you've, done a great, story. you've done a great job with your group and also your your interviews where you type people are very insightful. Um, Jack actually typed me through the socionic system. Um, I'd always been typed as an INFJ in the Myers-Briggs system, even by um, facilitators and um, leaders in that community. Um, and in socionics, he typed me as LIE which um, where we'll be discussing how sometimes you might get a different type in both systems. So we're going to be looking at that, but mainly we're going to be breaking down some of the major differences between these two systems because a lot of people think they're kind of the same thing. And it's not really, mm. that while there are some similarities, we're going to kind of go over why there's some differences. But if you get a chance and you're watching this, I know a lot of people who are big fans of Jack's work are watching this. But if you're watching from my page and you don't know anything about it, you should definitely check out World Socionic Society on YouTube. You can check out his interviews with people. You can sign up for a diagnostic, diagnostic interview. He does an excellent job. So I'm excited to break this down with you. Um, Thank you. Can you... um, one thing I'd say, Susan, um, about the, those, the differences, I think that Myers-Briggs and Socionics are two things which look quite similar on the outside, mm -hmm. but a bit like, say, you know, um, Mac and Linux, they, <laughs> whereas they do similar things in terms of the sort of different apps you can open up, you can both do word processing, you can both surf through the internet under the hood. I think they become very different beasts. Even though they both came from the from Carl Jung, they both are developments on Jung's original writings and psychological types. The theoretical infrastructure, I think, is very um, are, are two very different things, and that's what I'm looking forward to exploring today. 
Yeah, absolutely. Could you tell us maybe just a, a quick history of where Socionics came from? And then I will cover just a quick look at where the Myers-Briggs type indicator where it came from, just to give people an idea of the origins. Mm -hmm. Like you said, they both come from Carl Jung. Were there any people like My Isabel Briggs Myers altered, you know, mm -hmm. kind of changed up his theories or tried to make them more accessible, but was there someone in Socionics who did that with to create Socionics? I say that our version of Isabel Briggs Myers has to be Ausra Augustina Vitsiuti. Uh, which is um, one of those long Lithuanian surnames. E everyone just calls her Ausra Augusta. She okay. was born in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, she um, grew up in Lithuania and um, in Vilnius. And that's where she first started to develop socioscience as a theory. She um, worked as an academic. Um, and she wanted to understand her relationship with her husband. Okay. So it's a bit like with um, Isabel uh, Briggs Myers uh, working out, well, I think it was Catherine Cook Briggs trying to work out um, her daughter's relationship with her new um, fiance. Yes. And so it's a similar sort of, um, idea here. It's this, um, this woman who's trying to piece together her relationships with other people, understand them in some sort of systematic way. Mm -hmm. And that's how socioeconomics developed. Um, it took on more followers and other um, socionists like uh, Viktor Golenko, Alexander Bukolov. These are quite big figures now, both based in Ukraine. Um, socionics is now has a similar status to the Myers Briggs in places like Russia and Ukraine, another um, place which used to be part of the Soviet Union. And it's interesting when I got when I used to um, set up socionic societies at university. Uh, mm -hmm. Whenever I went to a couple of universities and and always you'd have someone coming along from some part of the of the old USSR. I had this one um, young woman from uh, Kazakhstan who mm -hmm. came along and joined. So you, you get, um, and it's interesting, to, the, to people over there, this this is like the Myers-Briggs, it's that popular, and people like to talk about it as a very um, interesting niche subject. Yeah. It's so in, far more pure over here. So if you were to travel to Russia and people would be saying, I'm an SLE or I'm an LIE instead of I'm an INFJ or, you know, whatever their types were. In I, my think, uh, I think a, a sizable, a very sizable minority of people would know what it is. And same, not everyone in, you know, the UK, right. the USA, the Myers Briggs is, but certainly a sizable minority would have, you know, gone to a socionics club or would have talked to someone who knows about socionics and heard about that thing, which you, you know, you type fictional characters in and you, uh, you find out about your relationships in. So it's got also sort of a pop psychology um, reputation in the same way that uh, Myers-Briggs does. Okay, that's really interesting. It's great to hear about that because I, I was completely unaware, you know, what the mm. history was. I'd heard all these Russian names thrown out, but I didn't know where its origin story was. So um, for me, covering the Myers-Briggs mm. side of things, a lot of you know, but some of you may not, the Myers-Briggs indicator was initially developed by Catherine Cooks Briggs and her daughter, daughter Isabel Briggs Myers, um, in the United States in the early mid 20th century. Um, it was inspired by Carl Jung's work in psychological types. Um, Isabel, it was during the World, World War II, and you know, Nazism was trying. You know, the results. You know. Isabel wanted to create a system where people could understand each other better, essentially, so that she, not only could she understand her husband, but she could under, that people could understand each other and there would be more world peace. That was a, something that was a really big deal to her. And so now the Myers-Briggs type indicator is used in 88% of the Fortune 500 companies in the U.S. So it's something that's become a very big deal. Um, it's but that's where it sort of started out. Um, and Carl mm. Jung didn't really, he, he didn't, you know, put his stamp of approval on it and go, yes, this is, I'm a huge, you know, that's where it, they got their information from Carl Jung's work, but they kind of took it and ran mm. with it to create the Myers-Briggs type indicator. So that's a little bit of the history from there. Um, now we're going into sort of the structure of the two systems, because the structure is very different. When you're talking about Myers-Briggs, a lot of times you're, you're talking about a function stack. Um, people who are new to Myers-Briggs are focused mainly on the dichotomies. Um, but then in socionics, 
and I could be wrong because I am a newbie. I mean, I've looked at Socionics and kind of dabbled in it for several years, but I'm by no means an expert on it. I think in Socionics you have like id blocks or blocks rather than a stack. So I will go ahead and give you what the Myers-Briggs structure looks like. And then Jack can go ahead and give you a look at what the structure of the socionic system looks like. I've got all my notes here. So if I look like I'm reading, I actually have. Um, yeah. So I like to think of the Myers-Briggs system of typology as people all have, are invested in a different layer sometimes. So the first layer that you get into when you first learn about your type is the dichotomies. Am I an extrovert or an introvert? So extroverts, their energy flows outward to the environment, objects, people, introverts, their energy flows inward. A lot of you know the difference between these things, but I'm just going to really quickly kind of give it to you in a nutshell. Um, so EI would be extrovert or introvert, and then SN would be sensing or intuition. Sensing people, sensing or intuition or you're perceiving functions. That's how you gather information and absorb it from the world around you. Um, so intuition is focused on abstract information and, and connections, whereas sensation is focused on concrete data and information from the, you know, that you can see, touch, smell, taste. Um, and again, there's a lot more to all of this, but this is just that first layer. So I'm trying to give it to you quickly. Thinking and feeling is, those are called the, the judging functions in Myers-Briggs theory. So that's what you do with the information that you're you're gathering. What do you do with it? Are you a thinker? Do you focus on logical analysis, pros and cons? Um, do you step out of a situation to view it impersonally so that you aren't biased? Or are you a feeling type? Are you someone who focuses on primarily on values um, and creating a, an environment of harmony? Do you step into the situation so that you can understand how everyone's feeling and how everyone will be emotionally impacted? Um, that's the thinking feeling difference. And then you have judging and perceiving, and that's how you respond in, and organize your life in, in relationship to the outside world. So are you someone who likes things organized? Do you like to do one thing at a time? Do you like having a structure and a plan? Or are you somebody who likes things more open-ended, spontaneous, flexible, um, kind of mix work with play and can multitask maybe a little better? So that's kind of a look at the dichotomy level of Myers-Briggs. And I know I went through that really fast, but I think that because most of the people who are watching this have some idea of what all that means. Um, and if you don't, feel free to ask, in a question, ask a question and we can try to help you with that. Um, the second layer, and, and when you take, by the way, when you take the Myers-Briggs type indicator, it's mainly focusing on those dichotomies. It's mainly trying to figure out, mm -hmm. are you a sensation type or an intuitive type? Are you a judge or a perceiver? That's mainly where the Myers-Briggs type indicator focuses. It's, you know, deciding power is on those dichotomies. The next layer of the Myers-Briggs structure, structure is the cognitive functions. So some people, they just, they learn about the dichotomies and then they stop there and they're good enough. And then you get the type nerds like me who are like, I've got to learn everything I can. And then they get into the cognitive functions. So through the cognitive functions, you learn that um, all these like sensing and intuition, thinking and feeling, they all have different orientations. So thinking can be introverted or extroverted. Sensation can be introverted or extroverted. Each of those things can be introverted or extroverted. So then you end up with eight cognitive functions. So there's introverted intuition and extroverted intuition, introverted sensation and extroverted sensation, introverted thinking and extroverted thinking, introverted feeling and extroverted feeling. Um, so that's the next layer of, of the, the structure of Myers-Briggs type. I have slides, but I don't think I can find them really quickly right now. So I'm going to just kind of explain it to you. What I may do is after this broadcast, post some of the pictures I've made on my Facebook page so that if you want to go back and like have something um, visual to remember all this information with, you can have it. Um, 
but in the Myers-Briggs system, you have, they focus primarily on your four conscious functions. So dominant, auxiliary, tertiary, and inferior. And your dominant function is the area where you have the most natural confidence. Um, it's, the, you know, if you've been in, if you've grown up in an environment that, that stifled your use of your dominant function, you may not have as much strength here, but it's the most, it's the place where it's most easy for you to develop strength and confidence and power. Um, and um, some people in, in John Beebe's theory calls it the hero function. And I think that helps to kind of d define it better. Um, one example that I've heard is that when you're a kid, you have these natural strengths. Say you go to school and you're really good at writing and you push off math and you do your math homework last and you keep, you know, people praise you for how good you are at writing. And so you get better and better at writing. And the dominant function is the one thing that you just are always, that's where you like to focus your energy. And that's something that if you are raised in a nurturing environment will be really developed. You'll have a lot of confidence there. You'll have a lot of power there to use it in a really positive way. The second function, your auxiliary function is, um, BB calls it the mother father function. And um, this is supports the dominant function and it balances out. If your dominant function is a perceiving function, it balances out by giving you judgment. So if you're an INFJ and you have dominant introverted intuition, then your auxiliary function would be a judging function, extroverted feeling. And it would help give you balance support um, so that you're not a completely lopsided person just out there in the world totally focusing on what you can perceive through your intuition and not doing anything with it. Um, and the John Beebe's theory says that this function is how you nurture and protect other people. So that mother father is how like as an INFJ or an ISFJ, your mother father function or your auxiliary function would be extroverted feeling. This is how you would take care of people through extroverted feeling. Your next function down is the tertiary function. And some people like to call this the relief function. Um, John B. calls it the eternal child um, because there tends to be kind of a childlike quality about it. You can use it well, but you tend to be overconfident in your use of the tertiary function. You think because you enjoy it to a certain extent and it gives you some relief from, from wearing out your dominant function, you be, can become, you can think you're way better at it than you are. Um, and even peacock it a little bit. Um, so that happens a lot with the tertiary function. And when people insult you and it's in relationship to your tertiary function, it feels horrible. You will feel very vulnerable. Um, you will feel ashamed. That's very common. So the tertiary function is one that you use when you're comfortable, when you're relaxed and things like that. But it's not always one you tend to think you're better at it than you really are. And then you've got the inferior function, and Beeb calls this the anima or animus. It's the gateway to the unconscious. The inferior function is one that you wish you could be good at it. Some people call it the aspiring function, um, and you wish you could be good at it. You kind of a lot of times it shows up in your dreams, but there's something it continue it constantly feels out of reach. It feels like something you're grasping at, but it just disappears. Um, the inferior function is one that we can idolize in people and simultaneously condescend towards people at the same time. Because in our lives, we we have this hierarchy and the dominant function is always going to, in our minds, be more valuable than whatever information the inferior function is giving us most of the time. So. For example, if you're an ESTP and you're married to an INFJ, I'm speaking from my own relationship here, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you might admire people with INFJs and INTJs. You might think, wow, it's so amazing that this, this like abstract vision that they have of the future. Um, but when someone tries to talk to you about theoretical abstract topics, you might go, that's silly. I, why do I waste my time on that? It's not practical. It's not real. And you might be condescending towards subjects of that matter because your dominant extroverted sensing function is, is, is saying, this is not 
concrete enough. This is not tangible enough. This is, you know, we need to focus on what's real and factual and provable right now in this moment. So the, but the inferior function is also one that can be a catalyst for a lot of growth, but it's not one you want to just be like, I am totally going to focus on my inferior function all the time, 24 seven or anything like that. So I know I sped through that. Jack, you'll have to tell me if I'm just going way too fast or too slow. It's okay for me. But, but um, um, see if anyone else is finding it too much. Yeah. I can't see, no one seems to be complaining. So that's a good, a good thing. Cat, cat's watching. Cat, you just said your brain can't handle all that right now. Is is that? Are you talking about Susan? Or are you talking about something else? Um, I'll try and find out from Cat if she, uh, what she thinks. But otherwise, yeah. I I understood that perfectly well. Okay. That, yeah, and it's interesting. Also, I saw some similarities there uh, with socionics, which I'd like to probably explore a little bit f further once I go into my explanation of the socionics model and how it compares. Yeah, I would love to hear that. Um, and I know I know, I can kind of go speed through this too fast sometimes. So if someone is watching and they're like, holy cow, slow mm -hmm. down or focus more on I didn't understand something, just tell us. Um, so that in Myers-Briggs, they primarily focus on those four functions. Mm -hmm. um, dominant, auxiliary, tertiary, and inferior. And it is a hierarchy of conscious power that they're describing. So, mm -hmm. um, and then if you, and that was the second layer of type knowledge, but if you, then there's the people who get even further than that and they get into the eight function model of type, which is John Beebe's model. Mm -hmm. And his, we could talk about for weeks probably, so I'm not going to go really far into that because otherwise I might lose some of you and it's um, because it is it is complicated. But in that in that model, you've got instead of dominant, you have hero instead of auxiliary, you have mother, father instead of tertiary, you have eternal child instead of inferior, you have anima or animus. And then you have the four shadow functions. And the idea is that these conscious functions, there's an energy behind them that it's not saying that every single time you use one of these functions, it will always show up in this way. So it's not saying that, you know, as a INTJ, every time you use extroverted thinking, it's going to show up in a parental way. But many times there's this uh, kind of archetype sort of pushing out this energy in, in your consciousness. And I have a quote here that John Beebe actually used and I can't uh, find it now. So we'll just, but it's, it, you use these, the four conscious functions. Imagine yourself like in a clearing in the wood. Okay. And you're in the center of that. The conscious functions are everything that you can see immediately and sense around you. You have a certain amount of conscious control over those functions. You identify them as part of yourself. So for me as an INFJ, I identify NI, FE, TI, and SE as part of myself. I can, I can understand when I'm using those, I can understand why, and it's something that I don't have to really think extremely hard about but in BB's theory, the unconscious is like the, the forest out in the distance. We don't necessarily have the conscious power to put behind those functions that we do with the primary four cognitive functions. They still, they still can be catalysts for growth in us as people. Mm -hmm. um, they're very important for us to use so that we're not projecting our weaknesses in those areas on other people. Because if, say, you're a ESFJ and you have um, demon TE in the mm -hmm. BB system, you might project these really negative qualities onto TE dominant types because you haven't you haven't recognized that part of yourself. So, mm -hmm. in BB's model, you have after those top four primary conscious functions, you have the up opposing role, which is would be fifth. Um, you have the critical parent, some people call it the witch, some people call it the cynic, some people call it critical parent after that. And that's how you um, belittle 
or set limits on yourself or others. You have the trickster, uh, that seventh, and the trickster creates double binds and kind of creates all this chaos so that um, growth can eventually happen. Um, and then after that is the demon function, which is the greatest undermining, uh, not the demon function, demon archetype, which can be very undermining, but can also be a catalyst for a lot of growth and transformation in a person. And again, like I said, we could talk about this model for a very long time. There, I have done a video just about BB's eight function model. If you go back in my Facebook page, you can watch it and it's like, an hour and a half. So I'm not gonna go way into that right now, but I'm kind of trying to give you a, a picture of how there's three different layers of typology or knowledge when it comes to the uh, Myers-Briggs system. There's the dichotomies, there's the cognitive functions, and then there's BB's model, which isn't exactly like Myers-Briggs, uh, the company that does that isn't exactly, um, they don't, do a lot with BB's model, but a lot of people who are proponents of Myers-Briggs also like BB's model. So now we okay, can talk about you, your socionics. Okay, I actually want to ask uh, just one question about having BB's model alongside yeah. the more traditional function stack. And I, I wonder, are the definitions which BB uses, are mm -hmm. they consistent with the definitions of the typical function stack, does it does hero, parent, um, child, and anima or animus? Are, would you say they are very much compatible, very much, um, very, very similar in their definitions, or do they contradict at all? Do you mean um, are the are they similar to the Myers Briggs descriptions of like dominant auxiliary? Yes. I would yes. say that. Myers-Briggs doesn't go into it in the same amount of detail that that BB does. Um, I do see a lot of similarities, mm. but they don't say things like, and officially in the Myers-Briggs type indicator, they don't, um, like the tertiary function is not, they don't say that it goes, that it's introverted mm. or extroverted um, in the actual Myers-Briggs type in, uh, manual, MBTI manual. Mm -hmm. So they don't go as into depth about how the tertiary, about how these functions show up. It's slightly more uh, yes. surface level, but they don't necessarily contradict either. So okay. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Um, okay, in which case, without further ado, I should get into the socionics um, explanation. So what I should say about socionics is when you first look at it, it can look pretty alien compared to people who are more used to the Myers-Briggs. If I were to give probably the, the fullest but symbolic coding of what a type looks like, it wouldn't be, say, ENTP or ILE. It would instead be something like this. And mm. You can see this table with these weird shapes. This is meant to be the full presentation of one's function stack as it were what we call model a now the reason we call it model a is not because it's got anything to do with cars it's not the four t model a it <laughs> is the model Ausra augustina Viciuti. i think just model augusta and other socialists have proposed there are their own models like there's a model b for bukalov there's a supposedly a model t a model g for galenko um but most classical socionists stick with model a that's the thing socionics like myers briggs is a collection of different ideas some more deemed canonical others less canonical more apocryphal you could say and in the same way myers briggs the official one is probably that from the company you have bb as a an expert outside the official company offering his own um explanations you also have Lenton and Neil Thompson Bents. In the same way, we have people like Golenko, we have people like Bukalov, Talonov, Rain, and these other figures in the all from Eastern Europe, I should say. Um, I myself am um, probably offering some of my own ideas, but I'm one more, more examples of a Western socionist. But a lot of these Eastern socionists have their own views and theories. But if you see here, we see this these eight squares. 
And inside those eight squares, you see eight different shapes. So I like to think of a presentation of Socionics type as like a filing cabinet. And you have these different shapes to put into the filing cabinet in each drawer. And depending on which drawer the shape is placed in, it will take on a different role for you as a particular example of a type. So first of all, I should say what the shapes mean. So we have triangles, we have squares, we have circles, and we have these Tetris style L blocks. So when it comes to the triangle, the triangle is just our way of saying intuition. If you know much about Myers-Briggs, about Jung in general, intuition, I like talked about these flashes of the unconscious. Um, we would say that intuition is a kind of perception, very much of a, a Jungian school there in terms of a perception, something which lacks rationality, it is irrational. It doesn't have a sense of ought to it. It's just a sense of what could be, what will be. So a perception of something which isn't here, you could say. Whereas sensation, we have these circles. So these circles are going to be sensation. Now, sensation is the opposite of intuition. So still perceptions, but they're perceptions of our concrete physical reality through our five senses. It's perception of everything which is here right now in front of us. Now, those would be the irrational kinds of information, those which are perceptions of what is for sensation or what could be, will be, may have been for intuition. Then we go to the judgments, um, these rational um, in, in kinds of information elements, what you would call cognitive functions. And these would be logic and ethics. The square right here would be example of logic. So logic would be those more impartial judgments. Judgments being a sense of what, what ought to be, what should be, a rationalization. So those sorts of uh, more impartial, more objective rationalizations would be what logic would be. Whereas if you go to ethics, which would be this L block here, Ethics is more of a subjective rationalization, the, um, very much the partial, very much the sentimental about, say, emotions or attitudes towards things. Now, we also have this divide between things which are black and things which are white. The idea that the black ones are going to be extroverted, the white ones are going to be introverted. And the difference between an introverted, what we call an information element, and an extroverted information element or an information metabolism element is the full word. The difference between those is that the extroverted ones, they meant to expand the breadth of a particular sort of information. Um, Alshar originally described it as the maximizing the objects of information, the many different objects that we're looking at. Whereas the introverted ones, I would say, are refining the quality of information rather than expanding the quantity. Alsha would have called it um, something to do with a field, the field which connects these different objects together. For instance, and it's a good example of a difference in a field and an object. If you look at, if everyone is watching the video now to turn around and look at the room around you, you can see many different things in your environment. You probably see chairs, we're sitting on a chair, you can see your computer, you could see the door all these different objects together. Whereas the field would be the overall room, how everything sort of fits together into an overall sensation that is either harmonious or lacking harmony. Hmm. So that would be probably different between an object and the field. And that's an important thing about socioanalysis, which differs from Myers-Briggs, that we start with really trying to clarify what these different kinds of information are what makes them up. And this idea of layers is also shared in socioanalysis and in Myers-Briggs. We do have layers and they go quite deep. They go towards, um, for instance, to define even what we call a cognitive function, what we call an information metabolism element, you need five separate dichotomies. One would be saying whether it's objectively shareable versus personally um, interpreted. Another would be saying whether it's something which you actually uh, feel in a vivacious way, whether that's in a sensory way or a personal emotional way. Another would be dealing with whether it's more thought about, more perceived or, for, or judged upon in a way which is detached from us. So we just think about it rather than feel it. 
So all these different things come together to put together what we call the information metabolism element. These would be the eight information metabolism elements. The idea of information metabolism elements, why we call it that, it comes from Kapinski, Antoni Kapinski. He was this Polish psychologist. He's one of the main influences for Austria, the found associate alongside Jung. And he used this metaphor that in the same way you may be eating food and digesting it and turning it into your energy, what we call energy metabolism. Socionics is all about information metabolism, taking in information around us, analyzing it, making sense of it, then forming certain judgments, evaluating that information, and finally acting upon the world or acting upon the realm of possibility or the realm of knowledge or the realm of um, ethics. And in the world, and so you then change it in some way. The information is no longer the same as it was. So once again, you're taking in information, you're then processing it again, evaluating it, and then reaching another decision. And that continuous is what we call information metabolism. So information metabolism elements, a bit like um, Mendeleev's periodic table, the periodic table of these different kinds of information rather than different kinds of chemicals. And the idea in socionics is taking these different kinds of information, putting them in these like filing cabinet drawers to take on a certain role for us as a person. I think in a way that's quite similar to how BB talked about the Jungian archetypes being fitting into certain roles for you as a person. Model A takes a similar sort of approach. But the difference, I think, is it starts in this metaphysical realm rather than, say, BB going into the collective unconscious. And yeah, so that's that's what makes up information metabolism elements. I can go into the major differences between the information metabolism elements in terms of how they're defined. But I think first, what might be a good idea is to describe these four Jungian dichotomies. You did a very good job, Susan, in describing them in the Myers-Briggs point of view. They have slightly different meanings in the socionics point of view. So when you just look at the type in general, take an ILE, which would be, I would say is my type, intuitive, logical, extrovert, you could write that as ENT with a little P. Mm -hmm. Now, that would be sort of like the extrovert, the intuitive type, both um, can take the N, the second letter, make it a big N to mean intuitive. Um, then thinking, T, we call it logical. And then finally a little P, which sort of is like you're perceiving, we call it irrational. But each of those things are defined differently, some more differently than others. So to really understand what they mean, you have to sort of look under the hood, mm -hmm. look at what the function dichotomies are. And I talked about these information element dichotomies, five which come together, but there are also another seven which are used to define each of the functions. What we call a function is different to what you call a function. You'd call, um, say, extrovert intuition, introverted thinking. You call them the functions. We don't. I said we call them the information metabolism element. Right. Instead, a function is going to be the slot in which these information elements go into. So each drawer in the filing cabinet is what we call the function. The thing occupying it, the kind of information op occupying it, will be the information metabolism element. Okay. Now, I say we have seven dichotomies to determine what those are. I've got a little um, table here which shows each of the functions numbered and the, the, um, the side of a coin, the side of the dichotomy determining each. These seven going together give us our definition of each of these functions. So already there's a lot of different dichotomies coming together for you to understand how it all comes together, which is why I think the biggest weakness of socionics is its complexity. It makes it less accessible. It's hard for people to access it and try to understand it. It takes a while. I'll go through it in a briefer form for people because it does take a long time. But let's look at these original um, Jungian dichotomies in the socionics definition. First, let's take E, extrovert and introvert. That would be decided in socionics by what we call the bold and cautious um, function dichotomy. Now, bold functions are going to be the ones which are more confidently um, realized. They're the ones which output more obvious energy from a person. They're more overt, you could say. Whereas the cautious ones, they're going to be the ones which are more covert, more, um, what's the word, uh, more subtly 
um, sent out in people's behaviors. And so the way we would define an extrovert in sociology, I prefer to call it an energizer. I find that gets rid of more of the sort of socializing um, baggage, which um, people often carry over from Myers-Briggs when they're trying to learn socionics. I prefer to call it energizer and integrator rather than introvert. Um, the way we define this is that those who are extroverts, all the extroverted information elements, these black um, information elements, they are all in draws or functions, which are bold functions. So an example of a bold function would be your leading function, a bit like the dominant function in Myers-Briggs and in uh, Jung's original theory. So they all are in these prime positions, these black ones for an extrovert, where they'd be showing up more overtly, more clearly and confidently. Whereas um, for an extrovert, the introverted information elements will be in the cautious functions, which will be here, where the white ones line up here. If I were to make this an LII rather than ILE, a bit like the INTP rather than ENTP, but not exactly the same, these would all swap over right to left. So they occupy different positions. Um, so you'll find that for an extrovert, the extroverted um, information elements are more clear. The introverted elements are less clear. So what are we likely to see as a result? Well, extroverts in general will tend to be more um, impulsive, more spontaneous, more inclined towards action or even assertiveness because their extroverted sensation is more bold. They'd also be more inclined towards emotional expression because the extroverted ethics is more bold and they'd be likely be more charismatic on average compared to the introverts. They'd also likely be more open to new ideas and possibilities, more adaptable towards new perspectives because extrovert intuition will be in a bolder position. And they'd also like to be a bit more industrious, a bit more productive and pragmatic for making things happen and getting things done because extroverted logic, like extroverted thinking be in the bold position. But we have to approximate here because depending on the kind of extrovert, these will be in varying levels of strength, but it's a very much a very general approximation. Whereas the very general approximation for an introvert or an integrator in socionics, they're more likely to be more consistent and think through their ideas more carefully because of the introverted logic or introverted thinking being in more of a bold position. They'd be more aware of their personal attitudes and relationships with things, whether they like something or dislike something, it doesn't quite feel right because their introverted ethics, a bit like introverted feeling, but not quite, is in a bold position. They'd be more reflective, more inclined to go into mental wanderings where they see where things are likely to develop in the long run. They don't less like to just charge into things. They're more like to think about how it might turn out. And that's gonna be because of introverted intuition being in a bold function. And finally, they're gonna be more aware whether they're comfortable in their surroundings. They're gonna have a, an eye for the smaller details to be maintained in their life. They're gonna be more aware of a calm and flow in their immediate experience, which is gonna be because of introverted sensation in a bold position. So if you put all those things together, you get the general sense of an extrovert, the general sense of an introvert. The problem is it's very difficult for me to talk about all extroverts together and all introverts together because they will vary. Not all LIEs, for instance, the E and TJ, are going to be, um, well, ENTJ specifically, or the LIE, we'd, we'd say, they would not be particularly emotionally expressive, even though extroverts in general would be more emotionally expressive than other introverts, mm -hmm. whereas certain introverts might actually be a bit more emotionally expressive, but they'd be far less than the other um, extroverted information elements. So it's very hard to generalize across, because each one of these four dichotomies, the Jungian dichotomies, they're trying to encapsulate eight very different types under them. Myers-Briggs does this with their, with their test. They talk more about um, being oriented towards the outside world. A lot of their questions end up talking about how sociable you are, whereas sociology is very clear that's got nothing especially to do with extroversion. It's a kind of extroversion, but it's not the business-oriented, project-oriented kind of extroversion you see with someone who's more of a logical or thinking type. Um, now, if I were to go to intuition sensation, I would say that is probably more similar. It is about, an, either if you're intuitive, an orientation towards abstract information, or if you're a sensory type, and it, it's an orientation towards more concrete um, information taken in by your five senses. This is determined by the strong and weak 
uh, function, which is just here. This idea that you're going to be more capable of using that information in new situations. I think the, the clearest definition I can give is that a strong function is one where in a completely new situation to you, you should be able to find out how to apply it appropriately, take in the information, make decisions on it, and use it in an appropriate way to that situation. Whereas a weak function, that's going to be something where, yes, with experience, you can develop it. Of course, depending on the weak function, more or less, it can be more or less successful. Um, but in a completely new situation, that's going to be thrown off. Bukolov, one of these sociologists, talked about situationality uh, versus norms, that your best weak functions are going to develop a sense of norms over time. Ah, I usually use this in this particular way, but um, so I know how to use these familiar situations. But once it's in an unfamiliar situation, that these norms you create become overly rigid and they don't adequately adapt. Whereas when, once it's strong, it has that situationality, has the ability to adapt to these new situations. So I'd say those are the big differences. So when it comes to an intuitive type, they're going to be good at both kinds of intuition, whether that's extroverted intuition or introverted intuition. So both of the triangles are going to be in a stronger position. Whereas if you're a sensory type, one of your intuition is actually going to be in a better place for development than the other. It's still not going to be strong. You can't use it in all situations, but you're going to be more able to develop and grow in it. Whereas the other one is going to be far harder to develop. It's in a, if it's, especially if it's both cautious, when I talk about bold and cautious, it's in a cautious position, and it's also weak, it's like a double whammy, and it's extra weak. When you talk about the inferior function, what we call the suggestive function is going to be one of those double whammies. Whereas when you talk about the tertiary function, we call that the mobilizing function, that is going to be more single whammy, you could say. It's weak, but it's actually quite bold. And so similar to how you describe, it's actually going to come out rather cockily, overconfidently, and it will work reasonably well in familiar situations. But as soon as you find yourself in an unfamiliar situation, suddenly you fall flat on your face. Whereas you wouldn't necessarily put yourself in that situation with what you call the inferior function, what we would call the suggestive function. Now, if I go to thinking and feeling in uh, Myers-Briggs, we call it logic and ethics. A similar rule applies. This time it's going to be about um, ethics and logic. So those which are ethical types, they're going to have more access to both ethical information elements. But they're going to have far more limited access to these logical information elements and logic vice versa so i can talk about these types together so someone who's both intuitive and logical together i'd say my i am an intuitive and logical type we would call a researcher so there'd be more of an emphasis on the intellect abstract logical information being more into towards theories strategies a bit like your nt's or kiersey's mm -hmm. description of t's so there's a similarity there. The strengths are shared in the same, in a similar sort of way. But it's very much about strengths. It's not about values. Okay. The opposite of NTs would be the SFs, the sensory ethical types. We call them the socialites. Far more about in the moment interaction with people, sharing their emotions, building their relationships. Very much that sort of tactile meeting people face to face intelligence rather than this sort of intellectual more either abstract, more strategic intelligence. Then the other ones, say the STs, sensory logical types, we call them the pragmatists, far more about solving real problems in real time, applying a very concrete, practical use of knowledge uh, or, or logic, or it can be more imposing structure on the surrounding, organizing, bringing chaos into order. And finally, the intuitive ethical types, we call them the humanitarians, bit like the um, idealist and Kiersey, far more about abstracted feelings, a sense of a human condition, a sense of, um, either can be a, a sense of a, a cause which is good for people to go towards, or it can be about an individual's potential to be good, to develop as a person. And depending which value system you have, that can vary, of course, and I can go into that later. Um, so there is a bit, I'd say a little bit more nuance, I'd say about how you understand the intuitive type and a sensory type. Let's take an, an ESFJ as an example. So a lot of people would type Robin Williams in 
the Myers Briggs as an ENFP. I've seen celebrity types give him that type typing. Whereas I would say, why does he have to be an intuitive type? They'll say because he's got this sort of zaniness, has certain creativity there. Well, I'll say, okay, but when we take an ESC in socionics, they've got mobilizing extrovert intuition, a bit like tertiary extrovert intuition. So, so an ESE, the like ESFJ, that has developed to a certain degree should have that zaniness, should have that willingness to introduce new ideas and possibilities. What still makes them a sense is they don't have any introverse intuition. They're not going to be able to see what is inevitably going to happen. They're going to be very much of a spirit. If I just put enough enthusiasm and energy in the moment into what I'm doing, I can get through anything. But eventually mm -hmm. when things inevitably happen, it doesn't work out that way. So there's still a sensory type. There's still weak intuition in general, but they can develop the extrovert intuition which I think can cause them to look superficially like an intuitive type and can lead to certain typings of intuitor. Whereas I would say it probably doesn't necessarily make sense from the socionics point of view of Robin Williams being um, an ENFP or an IEE, we'd call it, because there's no sign of him having weak sensation. He had a good sense of the sort of the calm and enjoyment of the moment. He had a very raw, and very clear physicality, very bold and strong extroverted sensation i would say necessarily not necessarily valued but i think there uh, but also that extra intuition as a developed thing so these are sort of differences we become more open to how you can develop your strengths in socionics i know myers briggs also uses that it is very much involved in coaching but socionics has that i think built in right from the beginning the idea that you can, are meant to develop these areas and you can expect that in your typings of people finally i should talk about um rational and irrational, or what you call judging, perceiving. And I think this is the one which is the most different between the two different uh, theories. I know that Richard um, was posting on Twitter and asking us, are you going to uh, answer this question? Yes, we shall. So I know in um, Myers-Briggs, it's more about being more about being open to more possibilities or making decisions, seeking closure and moving on, having a degree of structure, seeking a systematic um, behavior um where, where it's tested in myers-briggs whereas in social it doesn't really have anything to do with that we've already described these sort of traits being more open to possibilities being more systematic and organized we talk of that as being more to do with where extrovert intuition or introverted logic is in your model a i'd say that say an entp yes they'd be the p so it makes sense in both theories that they'd be very open to new possibilities but what about an ENFJ or an ENTJ? Are they not open to new possibilities as well? I would say that out of uh, many of these judging types, um, I would say that they're some of the most open to possibilities. We describe that as be it being their demonstrative function. Extrovert intuition is their demonstrative function, their strongest thing which they don't actually value, but they still use plenty of. Um, whereas if you take a type like um, what we call the um, LSI, um well actually that'll probably be it's a bit harder with the um the introverts now i'll use another example i used to take an sle but like we could estp that's the type which can be very systematic can be very ordered because they want to actually impose structure onto reality they want to bring order onto chaos so they can be very organized and i can imagine taking the myers-briggs test these sles and coming out more as estjs even though they'd be an irrational extrovert sensation oriented type in the socionic system so instead, how do we define rational and irrational? Well, it's all about what some call the accepting or producing functional economy. I prefer to call it um, demand and supply. It's this one here. So demand supply, the idea is that some function positions, these, I say these drawers in the filing cabinet, they set a need. Whereas the supplying functions, they find a way to fulfill that need. So there's always a priority. The demanding one comes first in each block, a block being a row in our filing cabinet. So let's take a good example. So take an ILE, all the ones, um, I should not say all the ones. So this one, this one, this one, and this one, I probably can go to numbers up here as examples. Yeah, so the, all the odd numbers would be what we call these accepting functions. They set the need, Whereas the even numbers, the second uh, in each block, the, the, the second one of each block, second in part, they fulfill the need. So what does that mean? Well, 
for socionics, for an irrational type, all the irrational elements, say intuitional sensation being irrational elements, are going to occupy these accepting function slots. Whereas all the rational elements, say logic and ethics, are going to occupy the supplying slots. So demand um, would be irrational, supply would be rational for an irrational type. And for a rational type, it would be the other way around. Rational information elements become demanding functions and irrational information elements become supplying functions. What does that mean? Well, it means that take any irrational type, things to do with perceiving how things are, will be, may have been, or just are in this particular moment, that becomes the priority, that becomes the need. Whereas rationalization, say what is good, what is bad, what is correct, incorrect, what could be better, what could be worse, all those sorts of things are means of reaching that um, need, of fulfilling that need. Now that's very abstract, vague stuff. And it's why we don't actually use this very much when we're typing people. It just doesn't become useful because it doesn't show up very well in behavior. After a very detailed analysis of someone's motivations, you would probably find this order in terms of, ah, you're doing this for that reason rather than that for this reason. The ex intrinsic and the extrinsic will come out more. But it's very hard to see when you're just looking at behavior for a person. So it's not actually that useful for, for typing. And another reason it's so different, difficult is because you're going to have different sets of rationalizations in this priority, depending which type you are. And SLE, a bit like the ESTP, is going to use introverted logic in service of extroverted sensation. That's going to be nothing like, say, an IEE, -E, a bit like ENFP, which is going to use introverted ethics in service of extroverted intuition, completely different behaviors. So there's no single set of concretely identifiable behaviors or traits in a person that you could say would be the same of all what we call rational types or all irrational types. It's simply not useful for working out the particular sort of type. Does that all make sense so far, what I'm describing? Let me see. No one's, I don't, can't see anyone complain. I haven't seen anyone complaining. About How, what do you think, Sue? I, I think it okay. makes a lot of sense. I think it's interesting hearing it because there are a lot of similarities. Like I, you know, hmm. between, you know, not necessarily the Myers-Briggs type indicator, but the actual, when you get into hmm. the actual theory of the hierarchy of functions and some of the other studies that have been done, there's a lot of similarities. Um, for example, you know, a lot of things you've talked about, I'm like, yeah, that, that, that match, certain things really match up with the you know more in-depth study of Myers-Briggs type mm. um for example you know as an intuitive you're always your the your judging functions are in service of the perceiving functions that's something that we're taught um as a sensor mm -hmm. you know or um, as a dominant thinking type your your perceiving functions are in service of your your judging functions um mm. Even in, you know, when I took the MBTI certification, they talked about how an extroverted function has more breadth. And they showed a picture of like a tree with all these branches spreading out. And an introverted function yeah. has more depth. So they went into that as well as, you know, it's more the, hmm. it's more subjective. An introverted function is more how I feel subjectively about that particular thing, how it's impressing upon me. Whereas an uh, extroverted function is more objective, like what is actually happening in the world outside myself, and that's the real thing. So as you were talking, I, I was thinking, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that's that all. There's there was a lot that there are some differences. Not saying it's all exactly the same, but there's a lot when you get more in depth into, um, yeah. you know, it's hard to say Myers Briggs typology because a lot of people have taken. You know, when I say Myers-Briggs typology, there's the actual official MBTI manual, and then you've got, you know, gifts differing, and then you have books like, you know, like this one by Mark. You know, you have like so many people who have taken the theory and done more with it. Um, so yeah. everything, almost everything you're saying, I'm like, yes, that actually is something that that matches in a lot of ways, except for if you're talking about in socionics these um you know um 
like um, your extroverted functions will always be, um, what am I trying to say? Your non-preferred functions in Myers-Briggs or even in BB's, BB's system, they're always going to be considered fairly weak, like difficult to harness. And in BB system, it's there in the unconscious. Whereas in Socionics, you are saying that they, they like for a um, ENTJ or an LIE in Socionics, extroverted intuition, rather than being the critical parent, as it would be in BB's system, would then be the, I don't remember, what it would be in socionics? Ah, um, it's the demonstrator uh, function. Uh, the may, demonstrator. Maybe I should, yeah, uh, maybe I should go through model A as well, um, as briefly as I can, so people know what these functions mean. Because you went through BB, I mm -hmm. think it might be a good idea. People know what, what how, how I've defined each of yeah, these uh, functions. Let me do that. I think that that may enlighten some of the questions you're going to uh, ask. Sure. So let me just go back to here. So in terms of the um function where is it oh here we go okay so we have a bit like the dominant we have the leading as the first function and so that is going to be something which is let me see where we've got here here we go this is the full one the tough uncompromising and confident area of the psyche that powerfully commands our worldview is the source of why we do what we do it often is baffled by other people who seem to lack this focus can think them wrong-headed so in the way it's sort of like i say there's a similarity between this and the dominant function and or the, sort of like the hero yeah very so similar. there is similarity there yes and then next to it is the creative function a bit like the auxiliary function a bit like the parent it's less pronounced but it's, this one's cautious and no longer bold it's more flexible as well more amenable it adjusts itself to the demands of a leading function so it's more like a flavoring um you may find in, um, I know that in, um, some people talked about the Dom Tert uh, loop. Well, one reason why we may see this, where you start showing your tertiary function more than your auxiliary function. So I don't describe it as because your creative function is quite cautious. So it doesn't actually show up nearly as much as your leading function in most situations. So that's something which we need to consider how different the creative function is to leading. They're both, both of them are strong, and both of them are valued. Mm -hmm. And that's why we put them in the ego block. They're also what I would call public, other people call conscious, but I don't find conscious or unconscious really works so well if you really look at behavior. I prefer to call it public. It's about what we are bringing to the world. Everything in this top row, the ego blocks, what we're bringing to the world. One is the big heroic leader. And the other one is sort of like the, uh, the helper, the assistant, the Batman and the Robin, you could say. And the second one does flavor the first ones. So as a good example, you may find that an ILE, bit like an ENTP, the way they explore ideas with their dominant or leading extrovert intuition is going to be far more about theories and structures, different ideas and how they actually fit together and make consistent sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas you take an ENTP, uh, IEE and socionics, um, I'm, I'm, they don't naturally go one to one all the time. It depends on the different person, but just for the closest reference, they'll be using introverted ethics or introverted feeling instead of introverted logic that will flavor their extroversion differently so rather than then rather than the possibility of different structural ideas different theories it's going to be about people possibilities the potential of people around them and their personal views and perspectives yeah. so we'll see differences in the types in this way um now if we go to the super ego this is what's going to be rather different um Actually, you know what? I'm going to skip super ego just now. I'm going to go to super id, which is more familiar, right? The super id is past this big black line here in the middle. So it goes into what we would call um, private functions. This is what we do more for ourselves rather than about our interactions with the outside world. And it's also weak, but it's still valued. What does that mean? I mean, it's something that's not, we don't do it very confidently, very well, but we actually value and we need these things in our lives. So it's about our needs and aspirations. That's what the super id block is about. And, and we have two of them. Sorry, um, what would that translate to in BB's system or the um, Myers-Briggs system? So mobilizing and suggestive, what would those be? So 
So that would translate, number six would translate to the tertiary okay. or to the uh, child. Number five would translate to the inferior or the anima animus. And okay. so what we see here is actually leading the block super id is going to be the suggestive function. It's going to be our weakest but valued function. It's going to be about our needs, the things which we need people to provide for us, because we're never going to have that same level of confidence in bringing it about for ourselves. It creates that unsatisfaction. Our deepest unsatisfied needs does not know how to satisfy itself, lacks confidence, causes discontent and frustration. There's a path to fulfillment if another person does this for us. This is the element which, if someone provides it, it's a source of duality in our relationships. What we benefit most from other people and admire in other people because we don't have it ourselves. And a bit, and I think that also connects quite a bit to the idea of the anima animus. The idea of the anima animus is always the opposite uh, sex to yourself. Mm -hmm. In a way that relates a bit to sort of, you are seeing this in your duel, in your supposedly, according to the theory of your ideal mate. I say supposedly a bit disingenuously because I'm doing exactly that. I am marrying my duel. So that would be someone who's leading function is my suggestive function and vice versa mm -hmm. so she provides my introvert sensation i provide her with my extrovert intuition so that would be the suggestive function now as you see it's cautious it is quite flexible it's a bit like the creative function in a way but it's quite cautious and not really and not really standing out but it's a lot weaker and less competent it's not a quiet competence it just doesn't really know what it's doing mm -hmm. whereas the mobilizing function which will have tried to satisfy the needs of suggestive that is far more cocky, far more bold, far more, look at me, I can do this, and then it falls flat on its face and everyone laughs. <laughs> so that is going to be like the child, like the tertiary. It's our area of aspiration and growth. It's, a, it's, our, it's the sort of growth we take on for ourselves to try and be better. And we don't want other people to be doing it for us. We want to show everyone that we can do it ourselves. <laughs> we don't need any help in this. So it needs to win it when you're benefited from someone else. It's their creative function helps you the quiet helper rather than the uh, rather than heavy handed leading function. It's a bit like you may say, rather than Batman and Robin, imagine Donkey Ho Panza. Donkey Hope is all bold going off. I'm a hero and Sandra Panza is actually the sort of quiet, more competent one, who sort of looks after him, makes sure he doesn't get in too much of a mess. Mm -hmm. So in a similar sort of way we see this with a mobilizing function with someone else's creative. Now, our aspiration of growth becomes more capable as we develop its high risk, high reward. So we go into this area when we feel more confident in ourselves. People who are actually in a quite a stable, healthy position will start working on their mobilizing. High risk, high reward can be too confident with that nuance for unfamiliar situations can backfire, causing shame. We can see these all have quite mechanical definitions. We can see examples of people using these. I what one problem I've had with BB is that I've had difficulty seeing concrete examples for each of these being used. But you can see these very clearly, I, in my opinion, in socionics. We take, for instance, um, everyone always mentions Donald Trump as an example. I would say he and also Boris Johnson, for that matter, but two leaders at the moment who do this, they both have extroverted ethics, I think, in their mobilizing function. Mm. And so they're both very much about public opinion, how people are going to respond to them. And they'll do things to create reactions in other people. Sometimes that doesn't go so well, and they both end up looking like buffoons. It's not a strong area, but it is a cocky, bold, confident area. And then when it doesn't go wrong, they sort of withdraw into themselves, saying, oh, my goodness, I've made a mistake <laughs> here. How dare people? So that, that's how I see the mobilizing function. I think it works with, I think that's quite similar with how we see the child and how we see the um, tertiary based on what you described. I know there's a quite an, a notable uncanny similarity. But yeah. the reason I covered these four first, the, the ego super, is because I think the others is where it does depart quite a bit. Right. With MBTI, because MBTI just doesn't really talk about this. Yeah. With BB, because I think he's framed it very differently. And so yeah. I'll, 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 I'll go into that now. Do you want to say anything? Just because you were about... Oh, no, I'm just saying that... Sorry, you, you so sound like... Far... Gonna... Oh, no, I'm just saying that so far what you were describing about... Um, leading, creative, vulnerable, no, leading, creative, mm. mobilizing, and suggestive, sorry, I'm still trying to remember all this, is very similar to how BB would describe those hero, um, parent, child, and anima. It's very interesting, and I was reading a book up by Mary Louise von Franz. I don't know if that's how you pronounce mm. it, but she was talking about, or he, I don't even know if it's, okay, 
but I read the book yeah. and it was talking about how the inferior function is one that when you are criticized there, that's the one where you get the most emotional about it. And they were talking about, she was talking about driving a car with an, <coughs> an NI dominant type and how the person hadn't turned on the ignition and they were saying, why won't my car start? I can't understand. And looking at all these different things and she knew that they hadn't turned on the ignition, but she wasn't going to ask it because that was the inferior function and therefore it would create this huge emotional reaction and it wasn't worth it. Um, and, and so I've seen that in, in BB, you know, it's the vulnerable, the eternal child, some people call it the vulnerable child for, for mobilizing what you're talking about. It matches up very well where that function, we do get cocky, we do get playful and we're like, yeah, I can do this. And there's a sense of elation because you're proud of it. And mm. then when someone cuts you down to size, you feel very, uh, vulnerable and ashamed and you just gotta get away like let's pretend that never happened and then in you know in bb system the trickster is supposed to kind of protect the mm -hmm. you know the vulnerable child but but no i'm just like i'm just explaining to people here who are in mbti what he's explaining really does as far as i can tell match up very well with bb's um descriptions of how those top four functions would go but again mm -hmm. like you were saying there's going to be a huge departure now probably where those branch off and you, you can't really follow both necessarily without contradicting each other. Yes, and actually I wanted to just respond to that point you just made about sort of the, sort of the um, frail, more vulnerable area. I know for myself, where I've had probably my sort of nightmare social situation is where I try to sort of light, brighten up the mood using my extroverted ethics, my mobilizing function, and something goes wrong and they end up making people very uncomfortable. Mm. which is the uncomfortable side being introverted sensation in socionics. Mm -hmm. So for using my extroverted ethics poorly, my mobile function poorly, I end up with a hit on my suggestive function. Mm. And that I often find is probably the most painful experience for me. I then try to withdraw from the situation for a while until I build up my confidence more in a social situation. Um, so yeah, there is a similarity there. I would say the mobilizing function, it's an air of pride. Mm -hmm. So you won't like to be criticizing that either, but you'll be more like, no, I'm not that bad. You'll be more, you'd be more like, no, I'm not like this. Whereas the suggestive function, it's often more, let's do a pride. It's more like, yes, I know I'm terrible. I'm just an awful person and wander away into the corner. <laughs> and so that so suggestive function wants someone to really help them. They have no aspirations, no, no, no pretensions or delusions of, of being good in this area. So yeah, I think there is that. And what you said about being vulnerable, this is a problem with some socionics. Another problem is that some of the language is quite bad. The terminology is bad hmm. and confuses people. So a lot of people going to socioeconomics say, oh, where you feel all the emotional pain, that's your vulnerable function. Oh, okay. So as you can see on, on the screen, uh, that's the one up here, number four. It <laughs> isn't. That's the thing, it isn't. And they make, if you really think about it, you feel pain in a, a weak area that you care about, what you value. That's in the super id. So let me go a bit into the super ego which I'd say rather than pain is more about frustration. And, and uh, so just here is mm -hmm. our second row, our second block, the third and fourth um, functions in the um, socionics model A model. Um, and the first of these is called the role function. Now, this is going to be in terms of information elements, um, cognitive functions, it's going to be closest to the demon, you could say, but it's talked about in a very far less mystical way, you could say. Um, the role function is something which is uncomfortable to use. It's the opposite in its nature to leading. Yeah, because say if you're, say you're extroverted thinking leading or um, your role is going to be extroverted feeling. It's seen in socionics to be the exact opposite. They're mutually and exclusive. Mm -hmm. So mutually exclusive. So if it was uncomfortable to use, it's something which is in a present enough to uh, use in short bursts in different situations to some success the more the more familiar the situation is oh i think we might have lost jack maybe if someone uh, watching can let me know if <laughs> we are streaming or if 
we're having issues here. Let me see if I can check. Um, Someone uh, watching can. Hi, Susan. Oh. Sorry, my sorry, my my um my connection went a bit funny. Oh, that's can fine. Can you hear me? I can. It's been kind of a little um just as of the last few minutes, kind of going out every once in a while, but then it'll come back to what you were saying. So. Right. I'm going to I'm going to relocate. I'm going to relocate to a different location. Okay. Just um just because I, I knew I had a feeling this would happen at night. It's because of my mum's finished her massage. I can now go into the main room. Hang on okay. a second. I'll be right back. Bella. All right. While he's gone, let me see if anyone had any questions about MBTI specifically that I could answer. Uh, let's see. Um. Okay. Um, there are a lot of comments. Okay. So I, um, one of the things about M. Myers-Briggs that in comparing the two systems is that you will have the same, um, with extroverts, you will have the same amount of breadth of knowledge. With introverts, one of the things he talked about was the judging perceiving difference. Um, the idea with introversion in the Myers-Briggs system is that you still have, um, so for example, an ENTJ or an intuitive judging type would still have a lot of these ideas and they would still have a lot of these possibilities swimming around in their mind, but they wouldn't be externalizing them as much. They wouldn't be um, putting them out there in conversation. It would be more of an internal process. So one of the things he was saying is that judges and perceivers in the Myers-Briggs system um, you know, you have judges who have all these ideas and socionics covers that really well. One thing that I do want to clarify is that in the Myers-Briggs system, if you are an intuitive judger or a sensing judger, you still, um, or an intuitive judger, you still have all these ideas and possibilities swimming around in your, your mind, but you may not be extroverting them as much because it's an introverted process. So it's going to be more of an internal probing that's going on in your mind. Um, and I'm trying to think here. So one thing is a lot of um, judges, I introverted judges mistype as perceivers when they take the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Sorry, I was just trying to fill up space while you were gone. <laughs> so I'm talking a little bit about the uh, JP in Myers-Briggs. I don't know if you can. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me see if he, we lost him again. Um, so the introverted judges in the Myers-Briggs system can often uh, mistype as perceivers when they take the Myers-Briggs type indicator because they do, um, inside they feel very flexible. Um, and inside they might feel like they have all these ideas and possibilities and swimming around in their mind, but it's referring to on the outside how they're interacting. Okay. You're back. Hello. Yay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I um, unfortunately wasn't able to find that the room I was using is still being occupied by my mother having her <laughs> deep time massage. It's all right. So, we have big ones now. So I'm sitting in my sister's room instead. But let me um, go back to sharing the screen so I can. Uh, here we go. Let's see where it is. Good. So, yeah. About. Um, so, where was I? I was talking about the role and the vulnerable function. So, the role. Yes, it's something which is the opposite of our leading function, the opposite in nature. It's mutually um, exclusive. Um, so it feels uncomfortable to use. It's something which is still present enough that we recognize it is important to do in society. If we don't, we simply won't get by. So it's something that we reluctantly act on, but we'd rather not if we could get away with it, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. The idea is that when you meet your dual, you're sort of freed up from the need to use it at all. It's just not comfortable to use. For me, that would be extrovert sensation. So I don't tend to like being sort of bossy and directive. So I find that just shuts down possibilities in my conversations. Mm. That's why when I'm leading a conversation, I am very happy to be interrupted by anyone because I don't want to miss out on the possibilities they're saying. So I have to sort of force myself to be more assertive when it's necessary for leading a group. I was not going to get anywhere. And other types, take LIEs, for example, but like the integers, they have to use extroverted ethics at, from time to time. They have to be polite. 
they have to sort of pull in a nice face when they need to be. So they will get by. People don't tend to call um, LIEs rude unless they're angry. Then they can be as rude as they want because they don't care anymore. But, <laughs> no, but normally they'll try to be polite. But even though they may have quite harsh opinions personally. Um, so we see a role function being used as something which is reluctant, but we still do it. We grin our teeth, grit our teeth, and we get on with it. Now, the vulnerable function, I say it's not like people may think it's not something you should feel pain. Instead, I best describe it as a blind spot. Whereas the role gr grits its teeth and gets on with it, the vulnerable function is the computer says no function. It is. It just does not want to deal with this whatsoever. We have this idea in sociolics of what we, what we call an inert and contact function. I prefer to call it stubborn and flexible. So the same that leading is stubborn, that it's the boss, no one messes with the leading. And the mobilizing is stubborn as well. I want to do this myself. I don't want to be helped. I think I can do it myself, even though I really can't, but I want to feel that I can. The vulnerable is also a stubborn function. And its stubbornness is I'm not having anything to do with this whatsoever. You can't make me. So the vulnerable function is like a blind spot. You do not see or appreciate any worth in doing this particular thing. You just don't do it. And so it's very obvious to other people that you are failing in this particular area, but you just don't care. So if you often you may find with ILIs and socionics, a good example may be uh, British historian David Starkey. I'm trying to think of any sort of other well-known examples. Um, someone who basically just says what they what they want. They do not care how they're perceived uh, by other people. It just doesn't. They just not do not give a damn at what people think about them. That would be a good example of someone with extroverted ethics in their vulnerable function. Mm. Or you take types with vulnerable extrovert sensation, they're pushovers. They don't particularly mind so much their pushovers as long as no one is mean to them. Because for them, it's like, why should the world be about might equals right? That's completely unnecessary. I'm going to try to reason with people instead. They won't do what they need to do to stand up to for themselves. And it seems that every type has its own blind spot. So it's an inept blind spot. It's something we do not understand the point of, cannot adjust to in a way that is acceptable to society. It is supposed to adjust to the role's demands, but won't. That's the idea. That's why the role often fails as well. The idea in so songs that these functions are blocked together. They're, they're part of a unit. There's a demand and there's a supply. So the role function is, come on, we've got to do this thing and you're blocked to me, so you've got to help me out in this. And the computer says no. So it just doesn't work. It doesn't work out. It's dysfunctional, the superego. But it's not something which we care about. We'd rather not have to deal with it at all. Get rid of it entirely. Um, so, yeah, and vulnerable function is going to be closest to the trickster, you could say. And you can see that's okay. quite a different thing already. It's not about double binds. It's a blind spot. I do not want to deal with this particular thing. I guess yeah. if, you, if you had to draw some sort of similarity, you could say, well, the trickster does stuff which is, you know, unpredictable and strange. And if it's your vulnerable function, you're not even looking at it. The difference is you don't care. Yeah, the, the there's no similar. There's hardly any similarity between yeah. trickster and vulnerable, from what I can see. That I think the closest similarity you'd find if you're looking at BB system would be demon and vulnerable. Um, yeah. Not yeah. saying that you know. I, I mean, as far as just the descriptions of what that process does, um, because the trickster is supposed to have a certain amount of power, um, and it is supposed to create chaos to get you out of situations where otherwise you would feel morally inhibited in some way. Um, so it's supposed to be kind of this, you know, our ego, we don't think we don't want ourselves to do certain things because our ego wouldn't like it. So if you were an ENTJ, T E N I S E F I wouldn't like this thing. So trickster would come in and be, and create chaos and double binds and feelings of like damned if you do and damned if you don't and things like that to create this sort of chaos that gets you out of a situation but you're you kind of are blind to that it's happening because you don't your ego wouldn't like that this is going on you wouldn't you know mm. if someone confronted you and said hey you are doing this you'd be like no i'm not <laughs> In BB system, these are, you know, it would be a blind spot in that you wouldn't be aware that you were doing necessarily these things. Mm. Um, and so, but so it is very different. I'm not saying, yeah. I'm not arguing different. which one's right, but, but 
No, but yeah. Uh, one thing I have often found when people do explain the trickster, because often there's a trickster comes to the thing which needs explaining the most. Yeah. I do find it can be difficult to tie it down to sort of certain traits in someone. It becomes yes. a rather long explanation about something asking something else to happen and then some sort of double bind popping up. And um, I, I've often struggled with explanations for it. I don't think it's anyone's fault. I think it's just how it's been put forward so far. I might quiz BB actually later in April when Should. I see it. Uh, I, want, I want to get to the bottom of this. Well, but, I think... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go on. I think he's purposefully left it kind of vague from what I've mm. seen in his interviews is that because of the fact that... I, I watched an interview with him where he said it's, he doesn't want it to be very clear cut mm. because it it shows up so differently in people. And so mm. that is one of the difficult things with... That, that's nice about socionics is that there are these type descriptions that say this is how this will show up in each position a little bit yeah. whereas with bb you get very uh it's not as clear like he doesn't have a list of this is how trickster f e f i t e t e i would show up mm. um so that is one thing that the information is kind of lacking but i think he almost purposefully made it so yeah, in some way yeah fair enough um I should also <laughs> go on to the ignoring and demonstrative. Yeah. Okay. So this would be what we call the id block. So the id block is strong, like the ego is strong. It's, again, private. It's, it's not so much private in terms of our personal needs and aspirations. It's private in terms of, oh, we sort of do these things for ourselves. We don't really want to draw too much attention to them. We don't, we don't actually take it completely for granted and don't think it's anything special at all. Um, so it's not valued, but it is strong. And this is the area which I think is perhaps quite interesting from a, from a sort of BB versus um, socionics point of view and also understanding the types and how they can be certain exceptions to certain rules. That um, let's start with the ignoring function, which is number seven. So that is, again, it's a bit like the vulnerable and that sort of a computer says no uh, kind of function. It's stubborn. Um, so it doesn't, it wants to at least minimize its interaction with that kind of information as much as possible. It is, um, the thing is, I think this originates in Jung. It's probably the other function which Jung actually sort of talks about in absentia. It's like the, op the, op the oppositional in BB. And, you know, Jung says, if you're, say, the extroverted thinking type, you suppress introverted thinking. And it's very similar in the ignoring function that this is not your preferred approach to that kind of information. So it's the inverse approach of our leading function. It is repressed by the leading. It becomes stiff and apathetic. It is capable, though, and skillfully minimizes its need to be used at all. That's the thing. You don't just walk blindly in. It's not a blind spot like the vulnerable function. Instead, it's, oh, do I have, uh, okay, let me, let me set things up because I know how to do this very easily, but I just don't care about it and I'd rather not do it at all. It's not really me. I'm just going to set things up. Don't have to use it at all. Hmm. So a good example would be um, an SEI or, or, or um, SLI. These are types which are introvert sensation leading. They're extrovert sensation ignoring. They don't tend to end up in confront confrontations and conflicts with people because they can. They have enough extrovert sensation. They're good at it, but they know how to read the room, where the threats are, what could be get them into a fight situation. And they expertly work to smooth things down so they never actually have to get into a fight. If they do end up having to have a one-to-one -one confrontation, extrovert sensation, so it's all about these confrontations, clashes, conflicts, having more impact in your environment and pushing other people out of the way as a result. It, if you ever have these confrontations, they can do it very well, but they minimize the need to do it at all. Um, so that's why I was exp explaining the ignoring function. It's still there, but it's suppressed as much as possible. And when you have to use it, you can use it and then get back to not using it at all. So it's still situational, we could say. It's a situational but quite stubborn and strong and cautious kind of function. And then we look at the demonstrative. And the demonstrative, that is, um, it is your strongest function next to the leading. But it's your strongest unvalued, subdued function. It's as strong as the leading, but you don't care about it. So what happens, it becomes very hyperactive in the background. It's doing all the, thi it's all the things you're doing, but you're not really um, drawing attention to in your communication. So it's, it's also the thing that you fall back on 
when you've just had a knock to your mobilizing function. I know for okay. myself, when I've had, um, when, I, when I've tried to create a social situation and it's backfired horribly, I'll go straight back to matter of fact, factual communication. Hmm. I, it's a safe area. I can very confidently do it. I just don't care about it. It's low stakes, low reward rather than high stakes, high reward. So it's kind of boring to you, but you, yeah. if you have to. It's probably boring. <laughs> like taking in lots of factual information and working out what is the most efficient way of using that factual information, improving <laughs> process. This could be done a little bit better here. It is not interesting to me. It's very boring, mm -hmm. very dry. Okay. And so, but I can do it. I, I, my, my, my brain's a bit like a sponge for factual information. I like giving off the interesting ones, the, the information which I think is more sort of tasty or spicy. But I, I don't want to give the whole fact storm, whereas um, I find an extroverted logic leading type, they'll be very interested in giving off all the information or as much as possible to reliably and helpfully inform people as much as possible. And they're very earnest about that. Mm -hmm. There's a difference in the values. Um, but yes, so it's, it's as powerful as leading, works in the background, being done constantly and expertly without any emphasis or expectation. It's low risk, low reward, taken for granted without pride, but reliable support for when the mobilizing backfires. And, well, um, for instance, people often say, a good example to me is actually, is um, take an LSD, a bit mm -hmm. like the UFTJ, but it's actually a very different type in socionics. Yeah. Now, they have demonstrated extroverted sensation. So, hmm. your husband is an example. They are very capable of being very forceful very uh, physical and they have a huge amount of physical energy they're constantly on the go doing things being very productive as it were and seeming never to really tire out but they um what they don't do is focus on the aggressive side hmm. they try to be they try to come across as more gentle and they underplay their extroverted sensation even though it's clearly there and they clearly but they can out. pull it out when they when yes. needed it's just exactly. like mm -hmm. And so someone like, uh, I don't know, like a Captain America sort of example, like a fictional example, very capable of, of, you know, dominating their environment, being the toughest person around, um, mm -hmm. the most responsive to those, their physical surroundings, certainly a natural leader. But they don't place the emphasis on the, I'm the boss here. Okay. They place the emphasis on how they can practically help out in that situation. So that's how I describe the demonstrator. And it's interesting because it means that you have every type and their sets of values. The things they value also have something which they show the most of which they don't value. It's like the mm -hmm. exception to their the rest of their personality. It makes them most different to the other types in their value family. But we'll talk about that later if you have time. So yeah. yeah. I think that was an amazing description of all of those. And everyone, um, I don't know if you'd be able to, or I can, can put a link to this page um, after this is over so that people who are watching this and want to check back with that can do it um, because it's hard to, I know we are just throwing out so much information right now and it can be hard, especially if you're new to this. And I know you've got a lot of people watching who are really well versed in this, but if you're new to this to be like, I am lost, I can't, you know. Um, so one thing I just want to quickly clarify is just the difference between, and I was going to make a picture of this and I, I didn't have time to do it, but so we have in Myers-Briggs dominant function. Yes. And then we have in BB, we have the hero function. And then in socionics, it would be called leading. Mm -hmm. And then in Myers-Briggs, we have the auxiliary function. In um, BB, it's the parent. And then in socionics, it's creative, right? Yes. Okay. And I know this is kind of dull to people who all know all this, but I'm just throwing this out there is to sum it up. So um, in Myers-Briggs, you have tertiary, BB, it's eternal child, and in socionics, it is mobilizing? Yeah, mobilizing that tertiary. Okay, and then um, inferior, anima, animus. Mm -hmm. What was the socionics? Oh, um, suggestive. Suggestive. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to just leave the socionics ones to you. I'll say the Myers-Briggs, BB ones, Good and idea. you can do that. So then fifth... Um, in, in Myers-Briggs, they don't really go into fifth through eight functions, okay? So it's just fifth, and then BB, it's oppos op opposing role. Yeah, which is like the ignoring in socionics. Okay, and then an in, interesting thing I, I did want to quickly mention, because I saw uh, just a little bit of similarity, opposing role in BB is they he uh, Mark Hunsinger kind of describes it as the passive-aggressive younger brother of the, of the hero. <laughs> 
So you it were is. talking about how, um, sorry, it's a, uh, what's it called in sociomics again? Um, the ignoring function. It is, it is sort of, it's a bit like, like I'm going to do this as little as possible, but just yeah. to, to do it, you know. So yeah. it, it's like a passive aggressiveness. <laughs> it doesn't want to actually, it's like, it's not passive aggressive in terms of being passive aggressive to others. It's passive aggressive in terms of how it treats that information in your psyche, as it were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a, and, and in BB system, it, it's, it's partially there to keep the ego for the, the hero from getting overinflated, mm. like from getting too full of itself. So if you were yeah. an NI dom, you're like, my vision, my prediction is the one way. And he would be like, well, I mean, you could look at these other things, you know, but um, so it's kind of like this, this little passive aggressive mm. voice maybe in the back of your head. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. I know. Um, I, I, I just want to very quickly add to that. I don't think I explained this well enough. Just this one bit that what what the, the circumstances when your ignoring function activates in socionics is when your leading function requires it mm. so that, oh, that's the difference there if that for instance take um i sort of going back to the sei example into the sensation type when do they get pushy and aggressive when they need to people in physical environment uncomfortable and they can't leave it to go to another environment they will then fight back very tenaciously and aggressively Okay. And another type, say an extroverted thinking type, they'll use introverted thinking in as much as it helps their extroverted thinking. And it's necessary right. for their extroverted thinking to do what it needs to do. Mm -hmm. So that's how ignoring function works. It's situational. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, um, well, that's good to know. And I think, I think it's, you know, in BB system, it's, it's like, it can be used for several things, but it's mainly like, to keep you from getting overinflated and it's to balance out in some way in some way they're all supporting the conscious functions in some way like in the oppositional role supports the hero the critical parent is kind of the dark side of the parental role the yeah. eternal child i mean the trickster is protecting the eternal child by it all gets complicated and, mm. and now i'm i could go off on that and i don't I don't want to get more confused. No, it's fine. But also, yeah, the demonstrative, I didn't say before, that is closest to the critical parent. Okay. The demonstrative. And, okay. And then that also has less of a, you know, um, not necessarily a negative role. You don't pay so much attention on it, but you're constantly doing it. And what's mm -hmm. interesting in social is that this actually plays a very sort of fluid interplay. Your demonstrative and your creative actually work very much together. Mm -hmm. Whereas leading and ignoring, it's like, no, I'm the boss, you're subordinate. It will, <laughs> Because the creative function is more flexible and the mm -hmm. demonstrative function is also both, they're both actually more flexible. Mm -hmm. And the one which is actually valued is actually more cautious and one which isn't valued is actually more bold. There's more of an equal relationship there. And so okay. you have a very interesting example of fluid interplay in different types. It's probably the most flexible, adaptive, and capable use of information. Perhaps far okay. less clunky than needing and ignoring. An example, you, you'll find um, the SLEs and ILEs. They're probably the best at taking in new factual information and quickly making sense of and resystemizing in their head to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas you take, say, an ENTJ, uh, well, an LIE or EIE in the social system, it's more about intuition. They're going to be the best at exposing themselves to a range of different influences and ideas, and extra intuition, and quickly synthesizing from that an overall vision or targeted outcome or goal, which is meant to work towards. Mm -hmm. And so we see these fluid interplays in this area. It's far more this is on top, this one's on bottom in the way that Jung described for the dominant leading, as it were, and the ignoring. That's really interesting. Yeah. And I, one thing I have noticed um, it with um, ILEs and uh, I, I have a really hard time like transposing the types. It has, takes me a minute to think it through. ILEs and SLEs? No. Yes. yes. ILEs and SLEs is that they do like uh, what you were saying, they can um, take in all this factual information really quickly and recall it very quickly. Mm. Um, like one thing I've noticed when I'm dealing with ENTPs is that they can quote something that they read in a book mm. like very well and, um, and recall these facts specifically very well. Um, and whereas uh, myself, I'll be like, I read some quote that explains this at some point. Um, you know, I'm looking in my notes somewhere, but I can't, you know, recall the specifics. So it's just interesting. To, it's just interesting that, that you pointed that out because it's something that I've noticed. I'm, I'm actually not. I'm not so good at quotes myself. Oh no. I, I, but I'll probably say 
that is perhaps more of a detail orientedness which comes from mm -hmm. sensation as well as yeah the it's taking more visual visually presented facts rather than abstractly understood facts you could say so there's mm -hmm. the interplay between intuition and uh, and logic or sensation and logic in the blocking as well which could make sense of that yeah yeah um oh, i'd love to just talk about this for like a whole week but um let's see <laughs> where were we yeah, go on. we were talking to, I, i'm trying to remember where we were had left off because you we were talking about the different function positions mm. and how they are described or how they're titled in each system so i think we left off around fifth uh which would have been mm, i can't remember mobilizing no not mobilizing oh that, that was the um the fifth in bb yeah, we we had been going through each one. So fifth in Ooh. BB is oppositional role, and then in in socionics is ignoring. Ignoring. Okay, and then we didn't go six through eight yet. Oh, uh, okay. So so yeah, go. On. Which one was sixth in BB? Six sixth in BB is critical parent or which. So in socionics, it would be A demonstrative. Demonstrative. Okay, and then seventh trickster, and then in socionics is vulnerable. Which some people call polar. Least resistance. Like yes. least, okay. Yeah. And then eighth in BB is called demon and mm. in socionics. The role function. Okay. The, the role we have to put on for society, but we don't particularly like it. Okay. Mm. So just a, um, I will try to create a graphic or something that I can share at some point that just hat lays all that out so that if people are trying to remember which is which, because I know that confuses a lot of people who are just trying to get into socionics. I'll try to make something that people can just keep and have to compare that. Um, and I know your website is a full of information that explains all that too. Um, um, Susan, just thank you so much for you know having me on your Facebook Live, and also um, thank you for appearing on my channel as well to explain Myers Briggs in a way which people who are say less familiar with Myers Briggs, probably more of the, the Russians and Ukrainians, probably are less familiar with Myers Briggs, and they can learn more about it through this. Uh, and just having this comparison, and, and also it's interesting to find actually some of these similarities as well as some of the differences and where that's different. I, yeah. I think the, now I remember I mentioned this earlier before we had the live stream that we probably have to do a two two of these and i think a second discussion like this would be very good for exploring um well at least in socionics quadras and uh the types um and also in myers-briggs probably the myers-briggs types so I think yeah we number two to do we we didn't really compare the descriptions of cognitive functions either which i think would be great mm -hmm. to do because yeah. i know like you said you were you've been talking about extroverted sensation and how that's described in socionics is a bit different than how it's described in myers-briggs which i think results in a lot of people who are esp in, so, mm -hmm. in uh, MSI, typing differently in the socionic system and so i think next time we we have one of these if we could maybe just go one function at a time and I agree. I can explain, you know, how Myers Briggs describes it, and then you can explain how Socionics describes it, so that we can kind of understand why there are these differences. Um, and then, like you said, um, we haven't gone into quadras, which is a really interesting mm. concept as well. And then just comparing the types, there's 16 of them, so maybe we'll even have to do three. <laughs> I, don't I think I think three. <laughs> I think the second one we'll do, we'll do uh, cognitive functions, information elements, and also quadras. They, they feed in quite nicely. And then finally, we can do types in our third live stream. And I think yeah. that'll be lots for people to look forward to. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. Having yeah. this conversation with me is extremely interesting. Um, if you, I mean, I'm very honored that you thought of me to, to have this conversation with. You're, you're the best person, Susan. If I know <laughs> I, honestly, I go to BAP, British, British Association for Psychological Type, and Christine, she's absolutely wonderful. She keeps she the whole, so much of the thing afloat. <laughs> it, uh, it wouldn't be the same without her. And she looks up to you. She posts articles from your website. <laughs> you are the knowledge. You are the best person to talk to. Oh, well, thank you. And I think you are the best person to talk to about socionics. I actually was not a fan of socionics for a very long time. I read descriptions on websites and I thought these are so rigid and just not like I didn't like it at all, actually. Mm -hmm. And then um, Micah Purvis, who we have a mutual friend of both of ours, mm -hmm. um, sent me your site and some profiles on there. And it was the first time I was like, all right, maybe maybe there is there's maybe this 
this is actually makes sense now. And I like how you describe the type. So if you're watching this and you're looking at socionics types online, definitely go to his site, worldsocionics.com, because his descriptions are much better than a lot of the descriptions that are out there. Um, they're, um, there's another person who does rights descriptions named Johannes Carlson on Twitter. He does a pretty good, he does a really good job too, but, um, but definitely check out his site. And um, if you're not sure of your socionics type, I had a really great discussion with him, with Jack, where he was able to decode my type for me and it was really informative. And so it's, it's something that he does. If you, where can he, they, where can people go to, to set up a consultation yeah. with you? So I find the best thing to do is just to email me. And that's just worldsocionics at hotmail.com. That's probably the best thing. Just pop me an email. We can organize an, a diagnostic interview. And it's interesting for your interview, Susan, because you didn't come out as what one would expect for an INFJ. <laughs> you came with a very different type in, um, in socionics. So yeah. So you can get something quite different, be quite a surprise. Yeah, I've, I've gotten a lot of kickback from <laughs> Actually, I can tell you how many emails I've gotten from people who are like, I knew you weren't an INFJ. <laughs> You're just a liar. And, you know, like, oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, was, yeah, that's the problem. My, my friend Kat is having a similar trouble. Um, I, 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 Kat Passionate, she's wonderful. But people keep on being mean to her on Twitter. And <laughs> we, she gets EIE in socionics. Yeah. Which one would expect to be like an ENFJ. Although mm -hmm. it's not. They're a lot more, a lot more passionate they're a lot more um of a wild card often far less okay. a sort of very responsible uh, pedagogue as it were and so people say oh well um she takes her myers-briggs they managed to sort her her best fit type is intj in myers-briggs it's mm -hmm. quite a difference there interesting people did the same thing with um people for the same thing of um Oh, actually, actually, no, that's not a good example. People were saying more than Nietzsche at one point. But yeah, either way, people are now saying, oh, you must be an ENFJ in Myers-Briggs. Right. You're, um, it's actually sort of a reverse, as you could say. And she doesn't like it. She's not an ENFJ. And so there's sort of people don't appreciate these are different systems. And so because yeah. of the difference is the different rules for what makes what, you can be different types in the different systems. I yeah. Personally, I wouldn't be surprised if you took, if people really took BB all the way, you get a different type in typical Myers-Briggs and different type in BB. Different yeah. rules lead to different outcomes. Yeah, and and I think that's one thing that I would love to talk about more in the next video um, because there are, I think in the, your years of doing this, you've noticed that maybe certain types more easily mm -hmm. cross yeah. over, whereas other types, it's much less... Um, much less common for them to, to match up. I know um, my the type you said I was in socionics, LIE, you said very rarely do they come across as ENTJ mm. in the Myers-Briggs system. And, um, but there's other types that have the same, the same thing. Like my husband is this very textbook ESTP in Myers-Briggs. You know, mm. if you read an ESTP description, that is exactly my husband. But in um, socionics, he is a LSE, yeah. which would, which, you know, people, if you trying to switch all the letters around, it would come out as ESTJ, which is nothing like in real life. Yeah. So it's, it's very interesting. And I'm very excited to go over that more. Um, but I do know we might overwhelm people with information if we try to get it all through today. No, I say actually the example of your husband will be perfect to explore in the second live stream. If we're talking about cognitive functions, information elements. Yeah. A very good example because there, it's switched around um so yeah I look yeah definitely to well thank you so much for everyone who thank tuned you. in thank you everyone for tuning in yeah and if you have questions later be sure to leave them and we will try to answer as soon as we can thank you take care everyone bye-bye <laughs>